Uh, Dr. Reba Carruth has her PhD from the University of Minnesota in Sociology from the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. She also has an MA from American University School of International Services in International Affairs from 1979. She's currently an adjunct professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University in Washington. Um, she also is very active at Mount Vernon uh, as a uh, history, historical interpreter there, and that uh, has greatly enriched her presentations uh, in this particular course. She'll make ref frequent references to George Washington because she knows George Washington very well, and I'm very impressed by that. Uh, in addition to that, she's launched a Spiritual Destiny of America initiative that includes public lectures, program support, historical tours, these kinds of, of uh, various uh, activities uh, in order to build understanding about American history uh, in the Baha'i community and the greater community in the Washington, D.C. area. So we will now turn this all over to Reba. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just want to welcome you to uh, session two of our webinar on Spiritual Destiny of America and the West. So um, we're going today uh, look a little deeper into the evolution of America and Europe uh, and how their transformation um, from countries that are essentially building uh, as um, individual nations and societies and in many ways very um, uh, um, contentious uh, powers transform themselves into a foundation for emerging world society uh, and, and a, a global system in which there is multi-level governance, which is grounded on the uh, notion of self-governance through the individual, the community, the, the state and local um, municipalities, the nation state, the region, and the world system. So today we're going to look at the spiritual destiny of America and the West and how it contributes to the building of world commonwealth, building on common norms, science, national policy and regulatory standards, which ultimately are turning and historically evolved from growing understanding of the interrelationship of the natural environment. So this is really quite interesting. And uh, before we do that, uh, one of the things uh, we want everyone to do today is to really focus on deepening knowledge and understanding of how this shared foundation, these, these uh, norms and values which are coming from uh, these Christian traditions, Catholic and Protestant, how these things basically shaped uh, this, this reality and this uh, knowledge of the power of common social and economic values and institutions and how they were used to project ultimately universal principles of oneness and commonality and working uh, towards shared um, values and shared goals and to come together to address shared threats. Now, in terms of the Baha'i faith, uh, we see uh, some basic fundamental principles and objectives which in many ways, uh, America and Europe and the West have historically been working towards in their own way. But from the point of view of the Baha'i faith, one of the central goals, which all peoples, regardless of their origin, their race, their, their faith, their nationality, our goal now in the 21st century and beyond is to establish this unity and oneness of mankind. So recognizing, building, upholding, and working to achieve the oneness of races and peoples and faiths and nations. Now, the way this is unfolding historically and also the way it, we are told in the Baha'i faith that it is, will unfold is through the est establishment of a common world commonwealth. And a lot of people think commonwealth is just about the market, but it's about establishing markets to achieve public good, public welfare, and also to achieve uh, wealth creation uh, around a set of shared norms and principles. So this issue of, of equity, social and economic justice are part of the context of markets within which 
wealth is being created and being shared and accessed by diverse peoples, classes, nations, and, and society as a whole. Also, this central role of science, science and knowledge and understanding of the natural world was very important in terms of the contributions of antiquity and the civilizations that the Western countries and the Christian societies uh, basically look to, to gain greater understanding and deeper knowledge of some of these realities, which in many respects are ancient in terms of understanding the relationship between the natural world and the world of humans and animals and plants. But when we look at Europe and we look at uh, America, what we see is that science became in many ways a tool for not just understanding the natural world, but for using that as the foundation for the development of society and economy and nations. And finally, uh, looking at how ultimately this this emerging world system and world view of uh, a common structure, uh, a shared oneness of humanity, uh, a shared uh, framework for wealth creation and um, uh, distribution of wealth and, and um, uh, of comfort, how all of that essentially once again is grounded on this understanding of the role, the central role of sustainable agriculture, natural resources, and environment. So here again, uh, what we have to do is to try to understand how these countries of the West uh, basically moved and were able to, in some ways, advance centuries-old knowledge and traditions and add to it and move forward. Now, very quickly, um, we, we don't have time to go uh, very uh, extensively in all these points, but I just want to respond to one of the questions which came up on Facebook. Someone asked, uh, well, uh, is there any um, acknowledgement of the contribution of other faiths and civilizations in the evolution of the Christian nations of Europe and, and of America? And the answer is yes. And um, that is something that all goes back also to the Old and the New Testament. What we see there is constant referral to diverse people's traditions. But also, if you look very closely, you also see reference to things that are basically uh, connected to the issue of science, knowledge of plants and fruits and vegetables um, as for medicine, things like that. The Old and the New Testament are sources that were used for knowledge of the good society. In other words, the conduct and relations between peoples within families, in society, between rulers and the rules, um, the establishment of, of a set of standards and rules of law, um, the, the balance between markets and obligations and rights and responsibilities between the rulers and the subjects of the rulers. Certainly, the societies and the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome are very central to the development of the Christian nations in Europe and also um, the creation of the nations in the Americas. And that is because uh, one thing that we very often lose sight of is that the European cultures amalgamated knowledge. So everywhere they went, whether it was for warfare or trade, they were gaining something. They would take things that were valid or valuable to them, take it back to Europe, build on it, transform it, change it, and then project it back out in some format. It could be ideas, it could be scientific knowledge, it could be things that were used in medicine. So one of the things that we see here uh, in the Capitol and Library of Congress is acknowledgement of the role of these ancient cultures and Eastern civilizations and diverse races and traditions and their contributions to the shaping and founding of the West and America. So when you go to the Library of Congress, uh, in the ceiling of the library itself, the reading room, where the congressmen go to read uh, and, and, and research topics which they have to deliberate on, in the ceiling you see beautiful frescoes um, acknowledging the role of ancient Egypt and the Arab and Eastern civilizations in giving the world science and mathematics. Also, they look to other civilizations and other traditions and acknowledge them. When you go to the chambers of the House of Representatives, which is a Congress, or the chambers of the Senate, along the walls you see 
the um, the depictions of great rulers, no matter where they came from, they are being acknowledged as contributing to what we have here in America and, and in the Christian West. So you see um, uh, portrayals of Hammurabi, you see Suleiman the Magnificent, you also see the classic European philosophers and, and uh, rulers of Europe. Uh, and so I, I think the, one of the most important things that, that we can also say is that the West builds and incorporates indigenous knowledge. Very often we like to look at ancient civilizations or civilizations on one side of the world, but it's also the indigenous knowledge which is coming from the native and indigenous peoples and nations in the Americas, in Africa, in other parts of the world. And that is just as important. So when we go to the gallery of portraits in the Capitol, we see a beautiful set of frescoes. And the first starting point of that fresco is the European, uh, in this case, the English settlers coming to establish the colony of Virginia as a trading company. And they are met by the Algonquin Indian tribes. And they are shown to plant this corn and tobacco, which really is the starting point of the colony of Virginia and the birth of the American nation. Now, one of the things that's very important to know is that when we look at the goals of Christian societies, of, of other faith traditions, in terms of the ultimate goal of achieving paradise on earth, it requires an understanding of the need to manage society and cultures and economy and nations. And one of the big contributions of the European countries and the creation of America and the Americas as regions is the fact that they are building over time, not just on the knowledge of antiquity, but on new innovations in terms of the relations between peoples and nations. Now, one of the most important areas of focus that we have to have to understand the contribution of Europe and, the, and America in this evolution towards world common wealth, wealth and world society and this ever advancing global civilization, which the Baha'i Faith talks about, is this innovation which was created with the Magna Carta, which is basically the Great Charter of England in 1215. Here we have King John of England, who is forced to sit down by his barons to basically have a very clear job description for the ruler. In other words, absolute rule is not something that is permanently or, or, or historically seen as something that is necessarily a good thing. So the balancing of rights and responsibilities of the rulers to their subjects and the subjects to the rulers became a point of focus. Uh, now, you can only have so many wars to divert attention from things that are not going right within your nation when you're a ruler. So the importance of the Magna Carta is that it balances the power of monarchy and executive rulers or presidents and serves as the foundation for representative government. So the Magna Carta is a very important document for the Christian nations that eventually moved to establish other frameworks that further refine the responsibilities of rulers to the people they are governing and also further defines the evolution towards um, self-governance, which requires that each individual be responsible not just for having rights, but also for having obligations as citizens to uh, not only um, manage their own personal affairs and family affairs, but also to contribute to community to contribute to society and to contribute to the nation and the global structure of world community. Now this Magna Carta also contributed to the creation of the U.S. Bill of Rights in 1791. And one thing that people forget is that while the Revolutionary War of the 13 original colonies for independence from the Great Britain and the King of England was very important, here again, they are, they are once again learning and building from what was established and achieved in Europe and in antiquity. So it's not wasn't enough just to have a constitution, but there had to be a bill of rights which specified these, these fine lines between 
uh, a representative Republican government or a Republican form of government in which representative um, structures are in place for the people so it can rule by the people. Uh, so here again, uh, this management and, and refinement of governments and institutions became something that was certainly an innovation and a contribution coming from uh, these countries uh, in uh, Christian Europe and in eventually the Americas, which, which is building not just on the traditions of Europe and antiquity, but also incorporating elements of governments from the indigenous tribal nations. Even the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the European Convention of Human Rights and the European, uh, what is now the European Union, are building on this Magna Carta. Now, another innovation that's very important to understand and, and to uh, know about when we're trying to understand the spiritual destiny of Europe and America in the creation of world commonwealth and the mobilization of, of government through international cooperation and the use of science in the public interest was this peace treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The country that we look to for this is the country now of Germany. Now, at that time, Germany didn't exist. You had a lot of kingdoms which are being basically run by different Germanic princes. Some of them are, are part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which would have been the, the Habsburg dynasty, and others were coming from um, the Protestant traditions of the princes of Saxony. Uh, but, but you also had princes and, and structures in a territory called Westphalia. So the Peace Treaty of Westphalia is important because it establishes peace and reconciliation of contentious peoples, faith conflicts, and nations, and uses this, this and elevates actually this role of establishing diplomatic relations and international cooperation to end these disastrous decade-long wars, which basically destroy many of the things that it took centuries to build up in Europe. So the ending of religious wars in Europe, the establishment of a system of recognition of sovereign nations, and the building of a framework so formal cooperation by sovereign nation states can take place is central to the establishment of an emerging world society and world commonwealth. It also provides a foundation for the creation of common bodies of law. So you have national law, which is coming from different bodies and traditions of law, which also eventually feed into a, a global system, an international system of international law, which is based on shared common norms. And there, this is where uh, emerging world society and international organization and world order are emanating. Now, Another important element here is spiritual and scientific enlightenment in Europe. In the Baha'i faith, we talk about the important role of science, but it's also the role of reason that is used as a balancing uh, mechanism so that we don't go too far in either direction and lose sight of the main plot. Now, what actually happened in Europe that is central to movement forward? Uh, in terms of establishing world community and world society. First of all, uh, the Enlightenment starts as an intellectual and normative movement around the 17th and 18th century in Europe, in which the roles of God and faith and reason, nature and humanity are begun to see, be seen as things that are interconnected. After several centuries of religious wars between the Vatican and the emerging Protestant uh, faith traditions and churches, it becomes evident that at the end of the day there is commonality that has to be seen in God, regardless of your faith tradition. And reason is what allows us to have balance so that we don't go from one extreme to the other. So um, this issue of nature becomes important because uh, the understanding of nature and the universe is central to the survival and advancement of humanity. And at that time, you begin to see great advances, not just in the understanding of nature as it relates to humans and mankind, but also the role of the animal and plant world and their interconnection in the world of 
of humanity and civilization. And that's very important because in many ways, when we look at colonial expansion, of the European powers, not just in the Americas, but also in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Asia. What we see is that they're gaining more and more knowledge of this vastness and ultimately this interconnection that exists between territories and peoples, cultures, and, and um, plant and animal life. The elevation of rational humanity, knowledge, freedom, and happiness as goals of society and nation. Now, in many ways, this is another revolution. It's not just enlightenment for the sake of, of learning more things from more places and learning more about science, but it's also speaking to the relationship of all of these things to the, um, the fundamental stability and well-being of individual society and nations. Um, now, this emphasis on the role of reason is, is basically something that is evolving in Europe and begins to spread around the world among the learned uh, because it allows people and, and allows countries and nations and rulers and people who are ruled to understand and integrate uh, this, this unfolding knowledge of the natural world with this unfolding knowledge of commonalities between spirituality and worldviews. Exploration, discovery, and integration, all right? This is, this is speaking to the fact that within Europe, you saw at that time an acceleration of cooperation between the natural and applied sciences. So moving forward, building on centuries-old knowledge of the natural sciences and the natural world, part of which is being made possible by this growing uh, global trade and the movement uh, and contact of peoples and applying uh, sciences to that knowledge which addressed real problems, real challenges, real needs of society and economy in Europe and ultimately in these um, unfolding um, communities and colonial structures and uh, nations that are existing outside of Europe. One important thing that people lose sight of is that there's a convergence of revolutions at that time. So you have a convergence of a chemistry revolution, a biology revolution, a human and animal medicine revolution, and ultimately an industrial revolution, which begins to transform Europe and ultimately America and the world. And it brings into focus more and more the need for cooperation, not just in terms of natural and applied sciences, but also cooperation based on shared understanding and common standards for the use and application of science and technology to solve uh, common problems and needs that are being faced by societies and countries in Europe and in the Americas as well as in Asia and other parts of the world uh, such as the Middle East and Africa. Finally, an expanded focus on arts, philosophy, and politics. This is another area of revolution that is coming from this spiritual and scientific enlightenment. So a combination of science and the divine are coming together in Europe at this time and are also being in many ways um, accelerated because of what's coming out of these colonial territories which Europe is encountering initially through colonies but ultimately through increasing trade and the movement of peoples and ideas from these territories. Now, when we look at Europe, we also see Europe creating an Atlantic world, a world that reflects its Christian traditions and belief systems, its view of society, uh, its, its interest in market economy, and we see the creation of a transatlantic region. Now, the creation of this region ultimately results in the creation of the United States, the creation of the North American region, which is Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and ultimately the Western Hemisphere, which is the entire continent of the Americas. Now, ultimately, that is basically the introduction of European structures and Christian faith to existing cultures and nations that are here. Who is here in the, in the Western Hemisphere originally? It's the indigenous peoples the indigenous nations, the Inuit, 
and Native American Indian tribes. Who are the first Europeans to arrive here to bring uh, new ideas and to bring trade and to explore through scientific and trade expeditions? Well, a lot of people originally thought it was Columbus, but actually it's even earlier than that. It's coming through the Vikings with Leif Erikson. Right? And we even know that uh, when we look at Greenland and Iceland and the northern part of um, uh, what is North America now, that there uh, is evidence that they even got as far as what is now Maine. They're uncovering uh, evidence of trade, Viking trade and settlements uh, in these areas. But one of the most important things to know is that the establishment of formal structures in the Americas really is the contribution of the Iberian powers of Southern Europe, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, because they're the ones that ultimately have knowledge of shipping and science coming from um, the, the uh, Middle East and the ancient world. And the voyage of Columbus is in many ways is testimony to this magnificent accumulation and mobilization of science and navigation which was coming from uh, knowledge and transfer of information from um, the cultures and civilizations of the Mediterranean and the Arab world. But we see a different evolution also in the Americas coming from other European powers, notably Great Britain, France, and Holland. Now, while Holland had a very small presence in the Americas, it's really this relationship between Great Britain and France that leads to this, this, this um, transformation and creation of what is now the United States of America and ultimately the shaping of North America. Now, to achieve this, what is happening in Europe? We see in Europe that serfdom existed. People think about enslaved labor in terms of other people, but in Europe, there was a very strong system of serfdom and indebtedness, which resulted in the create, <laughs> excuse me, the creation of whole classes of people, whole groups of people that were in many ways, um, in the case of Great Britain, put into prison because they were debtors. So you didn't just have to commit crimes, but, but if you were a debtor, uh, you could be put into prison. And many of these people ended up as indentured labor were sent to these colonies. We had a smaller number of Dutch and Prussian people or German people that were among this, this group, but a large number of English and Celtic prisoners and debtors are sent to the New World, in this case to the British colonies. You also have a massive transatlantic slave slave trade that is basically uh, fueling the building of the America. So North and South America are being in many ways transformed through this, this influx of over 10 million enslaved people who are prisoners of war in Africa, who are being sold by tribal leaders to Arab traders and ultimately find their way in this transatlantic system of trade and market development. So one thing I want to point out here is that enslaved African labor is legal and used by all the European colonies in the Americas. It wasn't just something in the English-speaking colonies. It was something that was legal and practiced among the French, the Spanish, and the Portuguese, and the Dutch. Now, from all of this, what we see is that world society and world commonwealth is being aided by this growing connection between Europe and the Americas because of the vast amount of territory and natural resources that are here in the Americas. And in some ways, that's what makes the Americas different from other regions. Compared to other regions of the world, um, the Americas has such a diverse uh, range of land, climates, um, uh, diversity of plant and animal life, that in many ways this made it unique for Europe because so many things could be done here. You can move people, animals, plants, things are moving from the Americas to Europe. One thing we don't get credit for in America is that 
Um, the Americas give the world potatoes, we give the world corn, we give the world tobacco, we give the world cocoa or cacao and avocados, and these revolutionize the world, right? So they may be seen as things that are, that are nice to know or, 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 or significant in some respect, but when we think about it, America is created and the British Empire is in many ways um, emboldened because of the planting of tobacco. That was the crop that the Chesapeake region, Virginia and Maryland, basically is here to produce for the British Empire. And it's fascinating that now it's become something that uh, is now not seen as necessarily good, but in many ways it helped change the, the structure of trade and the wealth structure of the British Empire in ways that in, in we are just now beginning to understand and how that it really feeds into the creation of world commonwealth. Now, the other thing is that in addition to knowledge of the interconnection of nature and, and territory and land, we see from Europe as these colonies and, and colonial trade structures begin to advance and begin to in many ways um, have connection with uh, parallel things that are going on in other regions of the world, the Europeans begin to see commonalities. And so you see the emergence of movements in Europe, social movements, scientific movements, economic movements, and moral movements, which become the foundation for um, these, these international conferences, these international organizations, which are set up to set up standardized uh, systems for regulation of trade. You know, knowledge of infectious diseases, the development of antimicrobial drugs, all of this is organized through the European powers because of this growing focus on and, and linkage on the movement of disease because of the movement of things from one part of the world to the other. And the growth of populations, the lack of sanitation to balance the growing populations of not just humans, but also animal livestock. So all of these things are, are, are things that Europeans are able to recognize because in a way they are uh, contributing to this, this evolution uh, and this movement of peoples and goods and also uh, these uh, uh, rising threats, which are uh, increasingly seen as things that can only be addressed in a global, in, in uh, a world world. Uh, system of governance and cooperation. Now, the other thing that's also important to know is that it's during this time that the knowledge of climate, climate change and the oneness of, and the integration of the entire global uh, environment is coming into focus. You have Alexander von Humboldt who makes his very historic journey to the Americas. Uh, he, he's able to meet with Thomas Jefferson. In fact, Thomas Jefferson takes some of his knowledge and tries to promote it as his own. But it's Alexander von Humboldt and his historic visit uh, on the Orinoco uh, River in South America that basically uncovers this interconnection between climate uh, and industrial agriculture and plantations and environmental change. And it's from Alexander von Humboldt in Germany that Charles Darwin, who is a, a British um, uh, scientist and explorer, it's from these two men that we begin to see and understand more clearly how humanity and world commonwealth is dependent on understanding and sustainability of these systems of government and society and economy which are evolving because of this exploration and exploitation of um, new territories and peoples in other parts of the world. So that's fascinating. One thing that is very important to, to keep sight of is that while Europe is doing all of these things, right, these innovations with government, these innovations with science, these these um, uh, new realizations of commonalities. One of the things that's very important to know is that problems arise because rulers lose sight of what their obligations are to their people. 
in the gleaning from the writings of Baha'u'llah, he makes it very clear that government is something that is not to be played with. It is a responsibility and obligation of the rulers to make sure that justice prevails and that all the people from the highest to the lowest are protected, but in particularly the downtrodden. Now, why is the downtrodden, again, important? Right? I said before last time in our first webinar session that uh, Christianity uh, focuses on and, and, and is building on Christ's teaching about the importance of the poor. But what we will also see is that to a certain extent, when we look at the creation of the nations in the America, it is not really a, something that is only a top-down situation. It's really coming from the bottom up. Because here again, most of these people that are in the Americas are not people who are there because they have standing. They are people there because they find themselves in a situation where other people have come in, structures are put on top of them, they're removed from their original uh, place of origin, or they're, they're forcibly brought here to carry out some function for people that are in power. And that's something that I think when we look at the spiritual destiny of America and Europe, that we have to relate to in, in a more sophisticated way. Now, the other thing that's very important to know is that in the writings of Baha'u'llah, he makes it clear that a Republican form of government in which uh, people are represented uh, at all levels, the local, the national, the regional, and the international is important. He does not remove the relationship of, of the king to his subjects. So in other words, kingship is not something that is seen as being um, necessary to remove. And that's the other thing. In, in representative government, revolutions very often remove ruling structures, they remove governments, but these revolutions can be dangerous because they are in a continual state of destruction and anarchy. So the role of kingship and the role of a good Republican government, according to the writings of Baha'u'llah, is to uphold the unity of all the people and all the interest, and to have that unity bound uh, with, with uh, very clear goals and objectives to achieve that common wealth, that collective good, and that unity. Now, Baha'u'llah goes on to say that the system of government which the British people have adopted in London appears to be good, for it is adorned with the light of both kingship and the consultation of the people. As I said before, it's Queen Victoria who responds to Baha'u'llah. She basically, out of all these people that he's writing to, who are holding the reins of government in Europe, she is the one that responds to him. And also, this is the country from which the United States of America is created. Promulgation of world peace. It is very evident that in the future there shall be no centralization in the countries of the world, be they constitutional in government, Republican or Democratic in form. He also goes on to say, Abdul Baha, that the United States may be held up as an example of future government. That is to say, each province will be independent in itself, but there will be federal union protecting the interests of the various independent states. The key word here is union, unity. That was something that was long fought in Europe, something that took centuries to achieve. But, but we also see that to a certain extent, an innovation is introduced because of this European territorial expansion and Western colonization in the Americas. So the question is, what creates the United States of America and the countries of the Americas that Baha'u'llah talks so highly about in terms of being in many ways um, lights that will basically shine and, and in many ways lead the world in achieving the oneness of mankind and humanity, in achieving the oneness of races and peoples, and, and also in providing a foundation for achieving world commonwealth. Well, what initially starts it is really this conflict and competition in Europe. Here again, these treaties of Westphalia, the Magna Carta, all of these things were significant innovations in government, 
but they don't 100% remove the destruction that is caused by religious conflict among the Christian powers and among the Christian churches and the competition for markets that emerges between the, the dynasties and the governments that are basically aligned with either the Catholic Church and the Vatican or the Protestant Church and Anglican faith. Now, the European competition between imperial empires is also very important because here you see that the need for global markets emerges. In other words, you can't just rely on what you had or what is around you in your region, but you have to also find new possibilities, new sources of wealth in other parts of the world. So this issue of territory and markets being uh, confined to just one particular time and place, one particular nation or culture becomes obsolete. And you have a seven years war in Europe, which is very dramatic because in many ways, uh, the creation of the United States is directly tied to this seven years war in Europe. And I will be giving you a reading list with links which so you can go to these uh, different sites and learn a little bit more about how these European powers and how these Christian faith traditions basically result in the creation of these territories which and colonies which become the nations of the Americas. Now, the United States is created by the British Empire. There are 13 colonies that are created by Great Britain, but Virginia is the first colony of the British Empire in North America. And essentially, there are three Americas, right? In North America, there are three Americas that emerge from European colonization. There is British America, or New Britain, French America, or New France, and Spanish America, which is New Spain. And each of these powers are basically here to establish extensions of their market systems. So they're here for territory and agricultural resources, which can in turn be extracted in a raw, undeveloped state, processed in Europe for value-added production and wealth, and put on world markets. Now, the other thing that people lose sight of is that in each case, British America, French America, Spanish America, this is made possible through the cooperation and support of indigenous peoples and Indian tribes. So each of these European powers is aligned with a specific uh, Indian tribe or set of tribal nations, which allows it to achieve this. Now, because there is growing tension between the Indian tribes and the indigenous people, they're not able to mobilize indigenous people as a work force. And this is where the African slave trade and the contribution of the enslaved African people becomes central to the evolution of the countries in the Americas, right? There is no workforce. There are not enough indentured white workers coming from Europe to do all of this agricultural uh, extraction. But also, by the time we get to the American colonies, what we begin to see in North America, in British colonies in North America, is that enslaved, unskilled labor is seen as a liability and an impediment to freedom. So what we see is a transition from this just unsustainable extraction of resources from the colonies in America and reliance on unskilled, indentured white European labor and unskilled enslaved African labor to more of a focus on the need for skilled trades and skilled labor. Now, the colonial transition and the creation of America is the result of the French and Indian War. So the European powers are fighting in Europe, even though they've, they've, they've had these treaties to try to avoid this, they are still fighting. They're fighting over territories in the Americas. And the English colonies are basically fighting with the French. So anything they're fighting for on, on the continent of Europe is also extending to the Americas. Now, France and Spain form an alliance against Great Britain because Great Britain is the Protestant uh, country that is fighting not just France and Spain for territorial interest, but also ultimately fighting uh, a, a conflict with uh, the Catholic uh, Vatican. 
all right, in terms of having the framework and a model for the governance of the nations and the region of Europe. So if there's more at stake than just markets. But what we have in the 13 colonies of British America, it's very vast agriculture and natural resources and land, which become a new front in this struggle. So the American colonies are also charged with establishing the English system of language, the English system and rule of law, English culture, and English models and systems for trade and markets. And that is something that is, is very important in terms of understanding the creation of America. It is directly created to reflect and to extend the British and English tradition in the Americas. Now, one of the things that people also don't know is that the English colonies are aligned with the Iroquois Confederation. That is how basically the French and Indian War is won. So the French have the Huron tribes in the north, and they are mortal enemies of the Iroquois Confederation of Indian tribes. So these tribes are fighting each other. They're giving the European powers knowledge of indigenous territories and waterways. All of this land is still controlled by the Indian tribes. But it's the Iroquois Confederation which in some ways adds more to this. They are also providing the English settlements and colonies and the King of England with new knowledge about organization. These, these Iroquois tribes have our confederation of tribes. So each tribe is allowed to keep its nationhood as an independent nation, but they have a common bond which unites them. And eventually, it's that common bond for national security, collective defense, collective aid, which provides the model for state and federal governance in the new nation after independence. Now, the French and Indian War is won in large part because the American colonies are sending regiments in the, from Virginia. The Virginia Regiment is led by George Washington to help the British Army push the French up into Canada. And you would think after all of this, everyone would be happy to just go back to a state of non-war, peace, and tranquility, but that doesn't happen. What happens after the French and Indian War is that there's growing concern by the advisors of King George III in, in, in England that they have to take more control over the colonies here because they also have to recover war debts that they've accumulated. And what better way to do that than just to extract all of this wealth through stamp acts, through tea taxes, through all these things, and just to pull it out of these tobacco plantation owners. Now, what people don't know also is that many of these founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and the like, these Virginia tobacco plantation owners are in debt, financial debt, to the King of England and the British Empire. Because part of the strategy is to extend these loans and lines of credit. Tobacco is a year-long crop cycle. If anything goes wrong, you have lost the value of that crop. So over time, the vast amount of tobacco that is being pulled out of Virginia and Maryland is destroying the soil. And the Indian tribes, like the Powhatans, Pocahontas' tribe, show the English settlers uh, when they come with the Virginia Trading Company from England to plant tobacco. They don't foresee global trade. So it's destroying the soil. All right? And also, George Washington begins to see that this is all part of an unfair... Um, and, and in many ways, non-sustainable system of society and economy. Everything is built around tobacco culture in the Chesapeake region. So society, norms of conduct, behavior, economy, all of that is relying on that. And he sees no future in non-sustainable tobacco and agriculture, which results in unfair trade. We can only sell the tobacco to the British on prices that they dictate. And also, it's relying on all this indentured and unskilled labor. He sees the future with skilled trades and skilled labor. So George Washington is bringing over skilled tradesmen and having them train the indentured white uh, European workers and also the enslaved workers so that they can have the same skills at the same quality and productivity and efficiency as their European counterparts. Now, the other thing that's very interesting to know is that the English are in trouble because 
they have overextended themselves in Asia and other parts of the world. It's really uh, upper class English people and noblemen that are really establishing these trading companies in India, right? And it doesn't work out the way they think it was going to work out. So they're in debt and they want to recover these debts through forcing the tea on the colonists and they taxing them uh, very high levels of, uh, of tax to, to recoup their cost. And finally, what we also see is that somehow King George loses sight of the fact that it's not a good idea to play one group against the other, which is exactly what happens. The Native American Indian tribes are seen as one set or one line of negotiation and strategy, and the American colonies are seen as another, and it doesn't end good. King George III acknowledges these Indian nations and tribes as nations. Some of these tribes have diplomatic representatives to the court of King George. They actually go there and, and, and deal with him directly, right? He's negotiating with them directly for access to territory. In the meantime, the American settlements are beginning to see there's more land westward, and they want to be able to expand in that land, but that's not easy because King George has set up agreements and treaties with the Indian tribes. So the trouble begins to develop on that front as well. Now, ultimately, by the end of the French and Indian War, it is seen as necessary to have independence from Great Britain. And that brings us to the American Revolution, which ultimately creates independence and creation of the United States of America. What is happening here? Right? We talked about Europe and the Christian nations of Europe providing these models, these systems of governance, these systems of shared norms and values of society and economy and law, uh, greater understanding of the unity of, of, of peoples and, and the oneness of, of the natural environment. What went wrong here? What caused the American colonies to fight the strongest empire, navy, and army in the world to win liberty? Now that's very fascinating because what we see, as we saw in the first uh, session, we see unskilled, no status people being elevated. In the first lecture, I talked about the disciples of Christ. Right? How some of them couldn't keep the days of the week straight, but they go out into the world and they create whole, whole structures which change the world. Something similar is going on here. What you have to know is that if you're in a colony, you don't have standing in the eyes of the Europeans. Right? Because you're in this colony because you A, couldn't make it in Europe, you are below the standards of, of people that had standing in Europe, or you become... Uh, a person of no significance because you're not of European background. So that basically is um, the enslaved African workers, the American Indian tribes, and the mixed race people that are beginning to evolve from this coming together of the Europeans, the Native American Indians, and the Africans. So here we have a situation where we don't have an army, we don't have a navy, the people are not trained, they're not seen as having standing. But somehow, George Washington and the Founding Fathers believe it is worth the fight, and these people are being elevated. They are also being recruited to serve in this Continental Army. George Washington integrates the American Army and military. He has to recruit free and enslaved men, black men, and African men to fight to win the independence of the nation. Something like one out of 12 soldiers in the Continental Army are free and enslaved black men. The most decorated battalion in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War is a black battalion coming out of Rhode Island. And ultimately, there's conflict among the American Indian tribes. They are, they are basically thrown into a state of civil war in the Iroquois Confederation. The decision is taken to stay with King George III because after all, he's a king. They can have a better relationship and more fruitful and advantageous trade relationship with him than with these struggling uh, colonies. But two tribes break ranks, the Oneidas, which are led by a woman, by the leader, and the Tuscaroras, and they throw their weight behind George Washington. They give him access to territories. They aid the Continental Army. They serve as scouts. And 
It's from this mobilization of these dispossessed people, these people with no standing, that George Washington and the Founding Fathers are able to challenge and defeat the strongest empire in the world. The goal of the revolution is self-governance, representative government for and by the people to achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a heavy lift, particularly when you're trying to also uh, gain your footing and have solid footing when you've come from a system where you are basically providing the wealth and the well-being for others. And what's interesting to know is that George Washington was a loyal English subject. He actually descends from King John. Remember, King John is the one who creates the Magna Carta, and he descends from nine of the signatory barons of the Magna Carta. So there's no plan to break away for him and his family. Uh, and he's very comfortable being a Virginia tobacco plantation owner. He's a farmer, but he's basically the one the other founding fathers choose as their leader because he doesn't believe in political parties. He believes in providence and the need for the grounding of liberty and the creation of the new nation based on higher moral principles and beliefs. So that distinguishes him from the other founding fathers and from um, the rulers of the British Empire. Continental Congresses are held to plan the goals and terms of the American Revolution for independence from Great Britain. Now, before we started this session, I, I happened to mention to, to Rob that um, uh, at Mount Vernon, uh, where I work as a part-time history interpreter on George Washington's estate, uh, we now have a relationship with the Windsor Library from, and Buckingham Palace. They are uh, releasing the archives. Uh, that document the correspondence and relationship between King George III and George Washington. What people don't know is that the Americans weren't unified on this goal of war. War is destructive. There were many loyalists who went against George Washington and the Founding Fathers and wanted to basically just try to renegotiate the relationship with Great Britain. Many of them worked with the British when they occupied New York and New Jersey and the other uh, northern states. It's these southern uh, colonies and states that really, in many ways, are turning the tide in the American Revolution. And in fact, George Washington and the Founding Fathers are sending letters to King George III and his counselors uh, requesting uh, the opportunity to negotiate and not to have to have uh, a completion of this American War for Independence, but they are seen as traitors they are seen as low lives, and they are seen as people not fit to live. So part of the problem is the American Revolution for independence for Great Britain is ultimately uh, a decision that has to be taken for survival. Because what do we see? We see that King George III has gone all across Europe to mobilize troops to extinguish the rebellion. So he approaches Catherine the Great, and uh, remember Peter the Great uh, in, in Russia. All right, he approaches her and she says, oh, you know what, I don't want any part of this. But the Russian, the Russian um, uh, empress is not the one who determines and sets this uh, final path which emerges and creates the United States of America. It's the Prussian princes who are involved in soldier trade. So the Seven Years War, the Thirty Years War, all these European conflicts are devastating the wealth and the standing of the monarchies and the princes of Europe. So they are selling, uh, among the, the Russian princes, they are selling soldiers. And basically these soldiers are mercenaries. And King George III, who himself is German background, or Prussian background, is recruiting them to come and serve as part of his army to take down this rebellion. So here we have these people who have no standing, they have no training, they are just people working the land as best they can. They have no skills. They're living in, in very meager, meager if, if substandard sort of accommodations just to be able to survive and continue. And now they are being occupied by thousands and thousands of English ships and soldiers and Hessian mercenaries. As Commander-in-Chief of Continental Army, George Washington resigns his commission after the Revolution and calls for the creation of formal union of these new states. Now, this sounds very glorious, but what people don't realize is that that wasn't the situation that existed. 
what existed were 13 new states that didn't have any good relation with each other. So they were headed towards being 13 separate nations. And George Washington sees the danger because the British just will not leave. Even after the defeat of the Revolutionary War, they're still lingering in New York. Right? They even come back after George Washington dies and burned down the Capitol. There was a plan to take his body and to desecrate it, to further break um, the, the, uh, the new union of states that he had created. So he sees that union is really the, ne the necessity for survival and going forward and for achieving commonwealth, because Virginia was a commonwealth. That's something that's very interesting. Virginia and Massachusetts were created as commonwealths by the English. So here, here's another dimension here. He says that confederation of states, where you just have um, agreement to sort of work together, is not enough because it creates openings for the other powers to come back and destroy the Union. So he foresees what's coming down the road. By the time we get to the Civil War, what do we have? We have a split between the northern and the southern states, not just over slavery, but over this sense of, of autonomy and the, the desire to not have obligation to ruling structures or common structures, which is fascinating because in the farewell address, which you will have as part of the reading, uh, suggested reading list that I give you, he foresees all of this. He also foresees what he calls a designing person who will see uh, an opportunity to try to unravel the Union. So he sees all of this. And certainly by the time we get to the Civil War, what do we see? We see the European powers circling the Confederate states to try to establish what the Confederate states feel are new trading relationships, but really what they are are relationships to erode this Union. Now, as I said before, the Iroquois Confederation of Indian Tribe provides the model, which is used by the founding fathers to create the federal system of government between the state and federal system. So it's that system which is used. So in the beginning, we have the Indian tribes showing the English what to plant, how to plant it, how to grow it, giving them access to territories, giving them knowledge of, of, of plants and animals. And we also see them now at a very important level, giving them a framework around which the country can be developed. So it's not just pulling from Europe, but it's pulling from these indigenous people. Now, the Constitutional Convention is held in Philadelphia. George Washington is unanimously elected president of the United States. Another thing that people don't know is that initially, democracy is seen as not desirable because it's seen as something that leads to mob rule. And the decision is that the only way the southern states will agree to this structure, which is laid out in the Constitutional Convention, is that someone from Virginia be nominated to lead the country. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington realize by the time they get to the Constitutional Convention, there is growing disparity between the northern and southern states. The southern states, according to the writings, of Abdul Baha and the Baha'i faith are special because they are the place where the climate is re resembling the climate of the cultures of antiquity. All right, so he says that essentially it's because of this connection and dependence on agriculture and the natural environment and the soil that that is the place where other things, not just agriculture, but a different perspective of reality and worldview is taking place. And Thomas Jefferson tells George Washington, the North and the South will not hang together, but they will hang on you. And they have to take the decision to get the country up. But George Washington is working up until the end of his life to call for the ending of slavery. And at the end of his life, what he does is he goes to his study at Mount Vernon four months before he dies, and he revises his last will and testament and frees all the slaves that he personally owned. Remember, it's these enslaved people that have allowed him to have success in this Revolutionary War. And he grants them their freedom if they survive the war because they are fighting for something higher than themselves. So he, he is the one that acknowledges that slavery is wrong, but it's a system that he is born into. But over time, you see him working 
at many different levels to bring this awareness to the moral consciousness of his peers in Virginia and the other southern states. And what is fascinating is not only does he free his enslaved workers, but he sets up a trust for them so they can become accustomed to living as free people and paid skilled tradesmen. So a lot more to know and to learn about George Washington, but there are moral foundations that are coming from the leadership of George Washington and these founding fathers, which are essential in understanding why the destiny of America and the destiny of Europe is tied to this common foundation, which is essentially coming from these universal principles and these common teachings of universal community, which is grounded in their shared uh, Christian faith. Foundations for the spiritual destiny of America. Well, the nation is created and the government upholds the existence of God and divine providence. Now, here again, this is something that even Americans have lost sight of. We really didn't have much to survive on when we came here. Many of the pilgrims died when they got here. They died of disease. They died of starvation. They didn't want to trust what the Indian tribes were telling them to do because, after all, they were foreign people. They were another race. They didn't believe that they had anything that they could use uh, that would be useful to them. Uh, they didn't recognize some of these species of animals and plants and fruits and things. They didn't know the medicinal value of some of these things. So it was not nice and easy, right? And that's why George Washington is the one that refers very often to divine providence because he has lost the Revolutionary War at a certain point, but he continues to lead this low-level group of people who are so attached to his moral vision and his universal uh, view of, this, of, of the world and of the reality of society and economy and of the natural uh, bounties that God has given to America, which will become, in this case, the United States of America, but the Americas, that they follow him. So what does this bring us in terms of the creation of commonwealth, of universal um, norms and world society? Well, from this revolution in America, we see the proclamation of these universal norms and principles in the Declaration of Independence. This is a cumulative document. It is drawing from centuries and centuries of knowledge and tradition, of philosophy and faith across time and place to come to this unified spiritual revolution. What is the opening of this document? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that are among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A constitution is created to formally document and articulate uh, what these uh, values and principles are for this new nation. And ultimately, constitutions become the mechanism uh, through which nations in the Americas and around the world, but also in particular in Europe, where they formally articulate and institutionalize the standards and the norms around which the country uh, is built and evolves. In the American Constitution, we see the following opening. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our prosperity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. What this indicates is that these people have a lot of faith because things are not where they need to be when they are drafting these documents, ratifying these documents, all right, we can barely stand, right? And George Washington is wise enough to know we cannot afford another war, which is just where we're headed if he doesn't basically focus on reconciliation with England. So he puts into place the Jay Treaty. He gets a lot of heat from Thomas Jefferson and others who really saw the American Revolution in some ways as an anti-monarchy, anti-Britain, sort of uh, movement, but that is not the case for George Washington. He sees the bigger picture. 
the Bill of Rights. Now, in order for the southern states, again, to sign off on these things, because remember, it's these southern states which really are the incubators for this decision to have independence because of the, the agricultural um, uh, role that uh, they are playing in creating wealth for the British Empire. They require that a Bill of Rights be attached to this Constitution, all right? And the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are this Bill of Rights. What does this Bill of Rights do? It spells out the rights of American in, Americans in relationships to their government, guarantees civil rights and liberties to individuals. This is where freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, once again, are amplified. Establishes requirements for due process of law, all right? This here again is confirming the role of citizens, the status of citizens. When we're a colony, we don't have rights as citizens. We are subjects of empires. But reinforcing this rule of law and process of law, it controls powers of the federal government. So in other words, things that are not delegated to the federal government uh, are not necessarily given to the federal government, right? This is where the role of states becomes important, right? So in other words, you have multi-levels of oversight, checks and balances. And finally, um, it really confirms that the Constitution is there to uphold people, not to use, uh, be used to discourage or to downgrade individuals and people. So no matter how we see people, whether we like them, we don't like them, if they're different from us or not different from us, the fact of the matter is there is a floor, there is a framework that is created, which is echoing these norms and principles, which upholds um, each individual. Now, freedom of religion is the defining principle of the nation, which emerges from the religious conflict in Europe. Again, if anything, Europe has learned over the centuries that religious conflict in the end is destructive. It's destructive because it's movement away from religion. Religion is really the education of people so that they can recognize their unity and their oneness in a common God, right? So there are principles, there, there are spiritual teachings that regardless of faith tradition are important. And that's why George Washington and the Founding Fathers make it very clear that people are able to come to America they are allowed to have their faith tradition and confessional traditions, as they call it. But we all have to come together under common standards and common rules so that we are one people. That's something, again, I think most Americans would do well to revisit. Now, commonwealth. How does America and Europe begin to add to this framework of commonwealth? which is being built increasingly over time on the exploitation of the natural environment through agriculture, natural resource expansion, and the application of science, and the uh, mobilization of skilled trades and labor. Well, in the Baha'i writings, this issue of commonwealth comes up frequently. Right? You don't hear the word commonwealth used a lot by Americans, but again, in the future it will be because it's part of our founding tradition. But Abdul Baha says, Baha'u'llah is putting forth principles and guidance and teachings for economic readjustment. Again, regulations were revealed by him which ensure the welfare of the commonwealth. As I said before, a commonwealth is really not just about creating wealth. It's about creating wealth for the management of public interests and achievement of public goods and common shared goals. So everyone is to put in the effort and everyone is to benefit. Rights and responsibilities are linked to um, the privilege of being able to be part of that commonwealth. So self-reliance, self-determination, uh, taking responsibility and accountability for ourselves, right, that's part of it. But the role of government in this regard and the role of the rulers and our leaders is to regulate imbalances. Now, one thing I will attach to your um, list of readings and links are some of the pictures that are also in the Library of Congress. There is a set of, um, of uh, pictures, there are four pictures, that illustrate what happens when there are imbalances 
in terms of justice, society, and economy, right? Because you have that scale of justice which shows up uh, in terms of um, images of, of justice and the rule of law. So the lady is blindfolded and she's holding the scale of justice. But in these pictures, you have a progression. You have wealth being created from agriculture uh, and the natural resources. You have balance. Everything is running well. And then in the different pictures, as you progress, the scale is being tipped. There are all these interests that begin to override other interests and begin to tip the scales. And productivity and efficiency is going down. The produce uh, coming from agriculture is not as good, is not as well managed. Um, and, and people are, aren't dressed as well. You know, this, this wealth isn't trickling down. Perhaps the soil isn't giving as much as it could if people were able to do more or have more resources to reinvest. Because in order to have wealth, you have to save and invest, not just spend and have debt. By the time we get to the fourth picture, things have gone really bad. The scale is broken. The people are laid out. The cl clothing is torn. And there's nothing in the markets. And after that, there's another picture, this horrendous dark scene of a man in total disarray, a very angry, vicious, almost monster-looking man, and his name is Anarchy. And around him are all the burning books. So what is fascinating is that common wealth is not something that we can put behind us and say, oh, you know, this is nice to know, this is something that we can do in the future, or maybe this is something that has come and gone. No, this is where we are today. The lack of commonwealth, balancing of markets to achieve public good and individual well-being, and the imbalance created by misaligned or unethical interest is what is causing the disparities, the disruption, and the, in many ways, the uncontrolled rage and, and anarchy that is being reflected in, in not just the Western nations, but in other nations and regions around the world. Now, what can we gain from all of this? What can we gain from the evolution of Europe and its central role in creating structures for international cooperation, for science diplomacy and cooperation, for the creation of world society where you come together as nation to work on your common interests and common goals and you work against shared threats. Well, we see that in many ways, Europe basically provides America, the United States of America and the other transatlantic countries in this region with a framework that can be built upon because all the countries in the Western Hemisphere were former colonies of European powers. So that's something that people forget. All of the countries, Canada, United States, Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, all of these are former colonies of the European power. And whether we like it or not, we owe a debt to the European countries and what they bought in terms of of knowledge and, and faith traditions and learning and science. We also owe a debt to the indigenous people, which also expand the horizons and the um, abilities of the European powers to go beyond just themselves, but to also see a more accurate view of the world. And finally, before we get to the end here, because I know we're running out of time and I want to leave plenty of time for questions, um, one of the things that George Washington says that's very interesting, he says the destiny of America is to become the granary to the world and the storehouse to the world. So he sees self-sufficiency and self-reliance uh, and, and um, well-being of society and economy being based on people essentially actively doing things on their own. He was the one that really believed that you can't rely on your family name, your bloodline, or whatever. You have to get your hands dirty and achieve things uh, based on your own abilities. And he, he even goes so far as to receive Phyllis Wheatley, an enslaved woman who's a poetess. He, she receives her uh, in his residence in Massachusetts during the Revolutionary War. 
because she becomes a world rec recognized poetess, even though she's an enslaved woman. The people that own her recognize as a young African enslaved child that she has this talent for poetry. So they hire tutors to cultivate that, 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 uh, that uh, talent. And she writes a poem for George Washington about his leadership, and he receives her for about a half an hour, which is a lot of time when you look at what's going on around him and the fact that he's losing this war and he's got to regroup and win this war. But he respected anyone that was able to rise above difficult situations and to pull themselves up. So it sort of goes back to this issue of becoming the granary and storehouse to the world. Um, he sees that when you do things from your own abilities and you work with the natural resources that God gives people and nations, you have a better future. You have more control and it puts you in a better balance. And if you're always working on things or doing things and not having a touch with reality. So I found that very interesting. And that's something that, that uh, we have to um, keep sight of. Finally, there are two prayers here, one from the Baha'i faith and the other is George Washington's prayer for America. What is Abdul Baha saying about the spiritual destiny of America? He's saying that he hopes that it could be the first nation to establish the foundation of international agreement. I said before, Europe has created a framework for international organization and institutions, right? We have to keep that ahead of us. They create that. But the foundation for international agreement is something unique for America. Why? because we are created as a colony and we rise to become a power. And this is instrumental for developing and emerging nations. There comes a time when you must stand and claim your nobility and your heritage and your, your role because you are part of this nobility that God has created in man. And that is really quite interesting because international cooperation is one thing, but reaching international agreement is very difficult because we are different. But we have to see commonality, and that is something that the American Revolution and this movement towards union, not just by George Washington, but also Abraham Lincoln, who we'll talk about in the final session. This is where the establishment of union and unity and oneness becomes uh, a challenge, but international agreement is necessary. He, he talks about how he wants to see and hopes to see America become the first nation to proclaim the universality of mankind. Well, why is this still an issue, right? Wasn't it the Europeans that basically are promoting these global social movements and these global um, um, uh, norms and values? Yes, they did, but in some ways, it's more believable when it's coming from people who didn't have status, right? Because it still, even today, um, it, there's still a sense that in Europe, uh, they still see the people and the nations outside of Europe as below them, behind them, not necessarily at the same level of them. And that includes the United States. They see the United States as we sort of the backwater co cousin, if you will. We haven't been around as long. We were people that had no standing. Uh, in a letter from King George III, when he recognizes he's lost the American colonies, he's, he spends several pages talking about how he doesn't want the people to come back, he doesn't want the Scottish soldiers that he sent here to come back, anybody who was anybody, uh, stayed in Europe, and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the letter, he's saying, but he does hope to have good relations with the new nation, and he hopes that they have good trade. So we are used as Americans to being rejected. We're used to... Uh, snatching victory from the claws of defeat, and, but we're also used to being comfortable with the fact that we come from many elements, which many cultures are not comfortable in doing. So that's another reason why in this prayer for the destiny of America, we see these roles being assigned to America, and likewise establishing the most great peace. Finally, when we look at George Washington's prayer for America, what do we see? Uh, we see a circular letter that he sent to the 13 governors of the new states. The 13 colonies became the new 13 states after the American Revolutionary War. 
and they are almost at war with each other, and he sees this as a threat. And so he's making this, this, this um, statement in his farewell address, and this paragraph has become George Washington's Prayer for America. And he's eventually telling them that he wants them to invoke God and to have God hold him in, hold each of them in his holy protection and to hold the states that they govern in, their, in his protection. And he wants the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government. All right, this is something that's very important. You know, revolutions sometimes give people the impression that they are to be in a constant state of upheaval. But obedience to leadership and to governance and to God is something that's central to advancement. Brotherly affection and love for one another. Right? Here again, brotherly love. Where is that coming from? That's coming from the Christian faith tradition uh, that, that George Washington and uh, these other founding fathers are building on. Finally, what is he telling them to do? He wants them to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean themselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which are the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, without which no humble imitation of the, whose example in these things we can ever hope to be a happy nation. Finally, to conclude, what does this bring us to? Well, this very quickly, all right? We see this evolution of Europe on several fronts. We see them evolving in terms of uh, formalizing systems of governance and nations and cooperation between nations through the establishment of institutions of government at the national level and the state level, but also institutions that are working across nations to build frameworks for formal international cooperation. We see enlightenment, bringing in science. You know, science wasn't always accepted among uh, the learned in Europe. It was threatening to the Vatican. It was threatening to a conservative religious order, so the Protestant faith. But enlightenment was requiring that faith and spirituality and belief in God be in some ways united with unraveling the universe that God has put at the disposal of man and understanding the unity of man and animal and plant life and how we are to be in constant um, awareness of the need to protect this intertwined system of life and existence. It was religious conflict that resulted in the expansion of Europe into the colonial world, but it's also the expansion of the creation of these colonies which gives rise to these new nations, which are in turn shaping this global system and expanding this knowledge and understanding of commonwealth. All right, now also uh, another thing I want to bring to your attention is that in many ways, when we look at the spiritual destiny of America and Europe, what we're looking at, at is something that is unfolding. Some people say, oh, that's well in the future. Or some people say, oh, the better days are in the past. No, we're, we're currently in this transformation. It may look grim at the moment, but keep in mind, it's always grim and dark before the dawn. And that's why we have to keep going. We have to understand that the spiritual destiny of America and the West is to move forward and to establish and proclaim and uphold that oneness of mankind, to achieve that most great peace, and to build a world system based on common norms, not diverse norms. People think diversity and multiculturalism is the end game. No. It acknowledges differences, but we have to come under common norms and standards for science and technology and for law to have common wealth. And that's why these universal principles become important. For our next session, our final session of the webinar, we're going to look at the spiritual destiny of America and the West in terms of international cooperation. What has to be done in terms of America and Europe to achieve this oneness of mankind, to achieve this unity of races, peoples, and nations, to achieve global and commonwealth for world society and world peace. And with that, I'm going to sign off and let you talk. Thank you very much, Reba.